Thank you very much, everyone, <laughs> for coming to our Tech Talk, our monthly Tech Talk. We are delighted today to have Dr. Fran Fanchen from Nemos to give us a talk on bifactor modeling of multifaceted constructs. Uh, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Before I introduce her, so before I introduce her, let me mention some housekeeping issues. Uh, for CME credit, as usual, you must sign in and must include your email and credentials. Do not miss our June 7th Tech Talk with Chao Kei Zhang from George Washington University. And also, please uh, note that April, our April 20th ID series, we will have a special guest, Dr. Ron Myers, Ron Myers. Oh. from Thomas Jefferson University, who, is, who will speak on arcade initiatives. And uh, Dr. Myers is really a, a good friend of Christian Ake, of the Value Institute. And uh, this is really an interesting uh, subject about uh, reaching the community um, of cancer patients and, and uh, uh, encouraging cancer patients to get treated. So please register to help us prepare for this, uh, for this April 20th ID series as well as for the Tech Talk. And as usual, the full schedule is posted on our website. So again, I'm really de delighted to uh, have Dr. Fan Fan Chen here. Uh, Dr. Chen is Associate Professor in the Department of Pediatrics of the Steve of Sydney Kimmel Medical College at uh, Jefferson University. She's also a Senior Research Biostatistician at the Nemo Center for Healthcare Delivery Science uh, at AI DuPont uh, Hospital here at, in Delaware. She has a PhD in social psychology from Arizona State University and has a very large number of publications, both peer-reviewed and book chapters, and has been invited to give talks both nationally and internationally. So welcome, and we are very excited to have you here. And thank you, Dr. Claudia, for the nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. So in today's presentation, I will introduce a very useful statistics tool. It's been underused, statistic, but rediscovered a statistics tool, the bifactor modeling in healthcare research. So my presentation style is interactive. So if you have questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. So the bifactor model has actually had a long history in factor analysis. However, for some mysterious reason, it has been shadowed by Thurston's multi-factor model. And it's only recently, so I would see this paper serves as the official introduction of bifactor model to the contemporary, uh, contemporary researchers. And research, uh, research, this model has been since then greatly used, increasingly used in applied research. So these citations actually mean, um, tell us the popularity, the usefulness of the bifactor model. So this is a 2006 paper, but it has been cited more than 600 times, and it's actually made to the top 10 2006 classics in academic and psychological testing by Google Scholar Matrix. Um, the second author, Steve West, if you use multiple regression a lot, you will recognize this name. There's a West, Aiken and West, multiple mm -hmm. interaction. It's a 1991, the classic book, that's the West uh, we're talking about. Also the Aiken and, and the Cohen, the Cohen, the recent the Cohen, widely used textbook, Cohen, Cohen, West and Aiken, that's Steve West. I was very fortunate to be trained by Steve West and Leona Aiken at Arizona State. When I was a social psychology student, I, get double tra I got double training in social and quantitative psychology. Karen Souza, he's the dean of college, she's the dean of college of nursing at University of Boulder right now. She was a professor at Arizona State School of Nursing. So I have a, I have a long history with health research as well, starting with my graduate school. So in today's presentation, I will first introduce the bifactor model, what it is, and what are the major advantages, why researchers are more and more interested in 
So this is five-factor model. And what are the major advantages compared to the existing traditional approaches? And then an example would be helpful. So let's use a five-factor model to address a conceptual debate regarding the distinction between subjective well-being and the psychological well-being. And then we use the five-factor model to test the functionality of well-being. So to what extent the well-being re is related to a wide range of variety of outcome variables, including biomarkers. So many constructs in health research are their multifaceted. Multifaceted means they're comprised of multiple related classes or domains. Because healthcare, healthcare re research related constructs, they're complex. And the constructs, so the coverage of constructs, needs to be broad and comprehensive. For example, the widely used Fairness and Powers Quality of Life Index, it includes four domains health and functioning, psychological and spiritual domain, social and economic domain, and family. Depre so is depression and anxiety. They all have multiple related yet distinct domains. So the question facing researchers is, how should we test such multifaceted constructs? And this has been a long-standing and unresolved debate. So let's use dealers at dinner. This is a very well-known researcher in well-being research. Excuse me. So let's use his subjective well-being model as an example. It has three components, positive affect, negative affect, and life satisfaction. So if we use the total score approach, which is we collapse all the domains into one single score, we capture the shared merits, which is subjective well-being. But we lose the distinctive nature of each subscale, subdomain. If we use the subdomains separately, we lose the big picture. We don't know. We lose what is subjective well-being. We lose the big picture. And also, the subdomains, it appears they capture unique variants. But in fact, they don't because they're correlated with each other. So let's. So I, in both approaches, can result in conceptual ambiguity. So ideally, we would like to have a model that would allow us to capture the commonality across all three domains, which is something called subjective well-being. But on the other hand would allow us to represent, to capture the unique variance of each domain independent of the shared variance, which is to separate the unique variance from the shared variance. That's our goal. And that's exactly what the bifactor model can do for us. So it gives us the best of both worlds. So specifically, the total score approach, it forms a by taking the sum or mean of the subscales, given each subscale an equal weight, mean or sum, it, 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 it's, it doesn't matter because the relationship would be the same with outcome variables. So if we form, it'll form a well-being index by adding positive effect and negative effect and life satisfaction together, or you take the mean. And then we use the composite score to predict outcome variables of interest, or we use the composite score as an outcome variable, per se. There are major advantages. First, it's simple. It's conceptually simple because we love par parsimonious models. And analytically, too, simple. It increases, it incorporates more items than any of the classes. Therefore, it boosts the reliability. 
because reliability is a function of the number of items, assuming all items are relevant to the construct you are testing. It also provides greater content validity than any of the individual facets. That is, the conceptual coverage of the total score is much broader than any of the facets. Therefore, they can more adequately capture the complexity of the construct. So that's why researchers are still fond of the total score, given these major advantages. However, the disadvantages are, it does not give us information about the relations between the facets and the outcome variable. When the total score is used to predict an outcome variable, it is unclear whether the outcome is associated with all of the facets equally, or is only associated with one single facet in all settings, or is associated with different facets in different settings. So this ambiguity could have important implications if only some of the facets is related to an observed effect, the total score actually will yield weaker research findings relative to the individual components because the non-predictive facets are included in the total score. So the inclusion of non-predictive facets can lead to the development of inappropriate theories, wasted research efforts, and inappropriate prevention and therapy programs. On the other hand, the individual score approach, it tests the facets of the construct individually by associating each domain with outcome variables separately because some researchers would argue, oh, I'm only interested in life satisfaction. So let's take life satisfaction and see what it does in terms of predicting biomarkers. The major disadvantages are it is concept for the individual score approach it is conceptually ambiguous because it cannot separate the unique contribution of a facet from the effect of the overall construct that is two sources are contributing to a significant relationship between the facet and the outcome variable the first one is the unique variance for example positive effect and the second source is the common variance shared with negative effect and life satisfaction. Another commonly used approach is multiple regression. Let's put all subscales into the equation and see what that does, what that would do. Well, the issue is the facets domains often they are strongly related to each other as we'll see in a second we have examples and these are examples these examples are actually representative of multi-facet construct multi-collinearity we cannot use them simultaneously put them into an equation so this is a dilemma we're facing a composite score captures mostly the shared variance, but it doesn't separate, give us the unique effect. Analyzing the facets separately does not solve the problem either, because the individual effects of the facets are often contaminated with the effects of the shared general construct. So both approaches can result in conceptual ambiguity. This is where the bifactor model comes in. And the subjective well being, that is called the general factor. This general factor captures the commonality across all three domains of well being. And independent of the general factor, we have three unique factors positive affect, negative affect, and life satisfaction. So these are the unique factors independent of the general factor that represents the unique variance of the domains. 
So the five factor is comprised of a general factor that accounts for the commonality across the facets. And these domain specific, specific factors or jargon, the jargon term is group factor. These domain specific factors or group factors, each of which accounts for the unique influence of the facets over and above the general factor. And then the general and domain specific factors, they can be related to outcome measures simultaneously. So you can get the predictive power of the general factor as well as the predictive power of the unique factor, domain specific factors simultaneously. But sometimes researchers, uh, they say, I think, well, you know, the idea is very nice, but sometimes it's hard to understand. Um, so I like, I tend to use, and then I use another example, then everybody understands. It's the example of intelligence. We all agree there are different types of intelligence, verbal, spatial, math, analytic. But they all share something in common, which is called general intelligence. So the general intelligence would capture the commonality across all domains of intelligence, all types of intelligence. But also we agree, we know someone who for someone who is generally intelligent doesn't mean that person can is very particularly good at math. That's where the unique predictive power or math ability is about. So if someone is generally intelligent, but also good at math, they would have a strong math ability factor here as well. And similarly, if someone is, has, is really good at verbal skills, and that person would have a strong verbal factor right here, and the verbal factor would have a strong predictive power in terms of predicting verbal of ability related outcome variables. So these are the um, matrix form for representing the factor model here. So in this factor, this is the, in this five factor model, you can see these, I, these are the I, X1 to X16 represents the items that for, uh, measure the specific abilities, the four types of, of intelligence. And all these items that measure something in common, general intelligence, and also the first four factor uh, items, they also measure verbal ability and so on for other items. So these are the equations for representing <clears throat> the relationship between the item and the latent factors. So for, for example, for X1, it's represented by gamma X11 and Kazai1. That's the factor loading, X1's factor loading on the general factor times the general factor plus its factor loading on the verbal factor times the verbal factor. The last one is the residual variance. So the variance of X1 is decomposed. I'm not supposed to move, but I think, can I go over there? Yeah, sure. Yes, yeah. okay. <laughs> so I, I think it makes more sense. So for item X1, the variance is decomposed into three parts. This is the shared variance with other items. And this is the unique variance specific to verbal ability. And that's the residual. Residual is represented by these little, um, little arrows. So these are the factor loadings. Factor loadings represent the strength of the relationship between the item and the latent factor it's supposed to measure. Conceptually, it's like regression weight, regression beta coefficient. We have standardized factor loadings and unstandardized factor loadings. So standardized factor loadings are just like standardized beta coefficients in regression. So it's very simple. If you know regression, factor analysis 
it's the same or structure equation modeling. But it's very easy to understand. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, sure. Go sure. back. Just, but your twos should, should change to three and four and five, right? So say for x16, mm -hmm. that's on um, five, not two, right? Like it should be on it. So you have it on the general factor. Tell me what the, that Greek letter is. You have alpha x16, one, what's that called? Your squiggle. Letter. Is the Greek letter whatever. In the circle. Delta, this one? Yeah. Kazai? Kazai? Yeah. Shouldn't that be a five? Or, or is it related? Yeah, yeah. Should it be five? Should be yeah. five. Yeah. 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 It's a typo. Thank you for. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure. Should get a You're in and then two, two three, four, one. five. Two, three, four, and five. So yeah. the overall, and then each unique one, each one has four. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for catching that. And okay. also, that means you understand it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm very excited. I want to make sure I get it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I think when I do the copy and pasting, it's from a different model. Yes. Because I don't know the Greek letter, but you. <laughs> thank you. And it's Greek. <laughs> My father. <laughs> you put that in there as a test for us, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. He's also a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> so there are major advantages of the bifact model. The first one is it can clearly separate the variance unique to each passage. Unique from uh, to each facet from the common bears shared with other facets. And it can simultaneously test the association of outcome variable with the general factor and domain specific factors. Yeah, I wanna just want to point out some of the colleagues here. So this is uh, my colleague from UD, and this is a colleague from University of Miami, this is a colleague from UD. And that's a colleague right there in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> that's, another, that's a colleague right there in the audience. Yeah. So just by for reference, Harvard was on my dissertation. He was? Hayes was my first clinical supervisor. <laughs> or so is my main collaborator. <laughs> what a small word. <laughs> and so he's sitting right next to me. <laughs> oh, wow. We're all connected. Oh, wow. So I, I, I met them at the University of Miami. I interviewed there, the both, I met both of them there at the University of Miami. Yeah. And then they moved to University of Delaware, right. and then I came here too. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was my professor down there, and now we work together. It so, just so happens we Carver? Up in, oh, no, weren't so. Carver's still in Miami. Okay, yeah. But he was on my committee. Okay. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. So, so you're in the psychology, I know you're a psych health psychologist. So, same family. Yeah. And reading it. That explains a lot. <laughs> You're on fire today. So, yeah. Look at if we look at this, um, this is predictive model, this part is called the measurement model. So, before we test any predictive relationships, the first step is work on the measurement. Make sure your measurement is. Sound. Pick the right measure and do the test. Make sure your measurement is sound. This model is good. Good factor loading. The load on the factors they're supposed to load. And then we move on to test the relationships. Whether, because that's the functionality, that's the ultimate goal. We have a measurement model. What can you do? So we use the general factor to predict, for example, critical thinking abilities. And also, this is a reasonable prediction. On top of the general factor, general intelligence, we would predict the analytic ability would have unique contribution over and above general intelligence as well, right? Okay, so that's what the buyback model can do. You can relate the general factor and the domain specific factors to outcome variables simultaneously and test the unique predict power of the domain specific factors independent of the general intelligence. In general, from all the data sets, all the models I have worked with, in general, the general factor has stronger predictive power compared to other domain factors. 
because it has advantage. It measures all domain, covers conceptually, it covers all domain. But also there are circumstances. The domain specific factor has a stronger predictive power if the domain matches this domain. So that's a domain specific predictive power. Can you also test interactions amongst your individual domain? That's possible. Yes, that's possible. The interactions among individual domain. That's possible. That would be a more, it's a fancier model, but still. So that this five fact model is very flexible and you can do lots of things with it. That's a good question, Mia. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Another advantage is the third, it can identify a facet that may no longer exist as a domain factor. Once you take into account of the common variance shared by, uh, with other facets, and this is very common too, for example. So once we take into account subjective well-being as a general factor, it's possible positive effect may not exist as a unique factor. And that, that way, we actually simplify. It simplifies your conceptual model. It happens a lot. It happens a lot. So that way, we can identify which domains are really unique once you partial out a general factor. So that's a really useful feature of the bifactor model, too. So it can, all these advantages can lead to greater conceptual clarity. Now let's look at some examples. So let's see what bifactor model can do in terms of testing well-being. So there are two, in psychology, there are two dominant views of well-being. The first one is subjective well-being. Actually, it's about what is a happy life? What is happy life? But does it cover it? The, the subjective well-being model came out in the 1980s. It has dominated the field for many years. And then people were asking, is happy life the all, all we want? No, we want a meaningful life as well, not just happy, meaningful. So then the psychological well-being model came along. It asked the question, what is a meaningful life? What does a meaningful life do for us? So specifically, the subjective well-being focuses on the hedonic aspect of well-being. It's the pursuit of happiness and a pleasant life. It involves affective and cognitive evaluation of life as a whole. There are three components we already see in the example, positive affect, negative affect, and satisfaction with life. So this is my favorite quote. Very little is needed to make a happy life. It is all within yourself, in your way of thinking. On the other hand, the psychological well-being model focuses on the eudaimonic aspect of well-being, the fulfillment of human potential, and the seeking of a meaningful life. Well-being is the outcome of positive, global pursuits. So Kara Reef from University of Wisconsin-Madison, she developed a model that has six related yet distinct components. That's what she conceptually she would like to test. It's a multi-dimensional, she developed a multi-dimensional scale, which is, which has six components, self-acceptance, positive evaluation of yourself and your past, environmental <coughs> mastery, capacity to manage one's life and surrounding world effectively, purpose in life. It's the belief that your life is purposeful and meaningful, positive relations with others, quality relations with others, personal growth, sense of continued growth and development as a person. So yesterday I was teaching uh, at the University of Delaware psychology students. I said, you guys are very lucky. Personal growth, you know, it's important to your well-being, but you have this growth every day. 
and so are we here. We are engaged, we are in the intellectual field, and we grow really every day, and it's a blessing to our life, to our brain as well. Did they agree with you? <laughs> <laughs> they did. They did. Yeah, I have, these are fancy graduate students. Okay. Yeah, they did. Okay. And then I said, healthy relations. I said, if you have a lousy roommate, you either develop a good relationship with your roommate or you change your roommate. <laughs> because it's very, very important. You don't want to wake up in the, during, in the morning and say, oh, I have to deal with this person. What a pain. No. You want to see, you know, smile at each other. Have a good beginning <laughs> in the morning. And, but researchers disagree whether psychological well being and subjective well being, there's a meaningful distinction between the two. One camp, the guy on the right, he argues well, subjective well being and psychological <coughs> well being, they are different. They address different aspects of well being a happy life, a meaningful life. They are different. But the guy, this guy on the, on the um, bottom says, well, Kashtan says, they don't. They're, they're the same. They operate similarly at a higher level. Therefore, it's more meaningful to, ex get, to test their similarities rather than differences. Well, that's where um, how backpack model can help. If the two types of well-being are different constructs, then they're supposed to form a general factor, given that both are related to positive nature of well-being. However, the components from each domain of well-being, they should form meaningful domain-specific factors with unique predictive power. If you want to argue, they are different. If the cash down, this guy, is right, then the two types of well-being should reflect two, um, they should form one strong general factor and the domains should not matter. The domains should not matter. They should not form domain strong, domain specific factors because the variance are largely explained by the general factor. You should vote to see which well, uh, one uh, Oh yeah. <laughs> Which one's right eventually? At the end of the day, based on the data sets I had, I had, yeah, two data sets. I think so. I, I vote for this one. You I vote think for, are, you think they're different, different. they're the same. They're the same. Okay, different. yeah. Who is going to vote for I'll the first different. one? I'll first one. Different. Okay. So, the first one, different? I'm abstaining. Okay. <laughs> okay. Second one, similar. Oh, okay, so we got majority. We're right. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> JP likes us to throw dark chocolate at us. <laughs> <laughs> he bribes his students. He rewards. He rewards after. Yes, I know. If you get it right. Yes. <laughs> That's I why I follow them here. is from undergraduate students from University of Delaware. And the second one actually is a representative, nationally representative sample with a huge uh, sample size. The third one is a subsample of the second one, the Meadows data set. It's a subset with biomarkers. The Meadows 2, data, the Wave 2 data set is actually, it's a very, very rich data set, public data set, if you're interested in well-being. I would encourage you to take a look at it. It's because you can do a lot of things. Yeah. The purpose is to examine the psychological, behavioral, and the physiological factors that influence healthy aging in the nationally representative sense. And by looking at this data set, I actually think Christiana Care can do a lot in terms of studying the well being of the patients. And we can create a comprehensive data set like that. 
and be used. We can apply for grants to support data, the collect, you know, the data set and be used by multiple by researchers across the country. I have had multiple applications and others too from this large data set. And this is something I think it would be good for Christiana Care. So these are the well-being measures and uh, psychological well-being is from RIF. And then Dinner has a uh, satisfaction life skill. These are well-known measures, so I'll go over, go over them quickly. And we we'll also included some outcome measures, a wide range. These are just selected ones, self-esteem, optimism, relationship quality, social support, self-enhancement, you think you're better than others, and depression from back depression inventory. So in study two, so these, these measures are included in study one and study two. In study three, it has self-reported physical health and mental health, also sleep duration, biomarkers, your body mass index, waist hip ratio, as to the good cholesterol and the ratio, et cetera. So model testing takes three stages. First, we tested the subjective well-being, and then make sure a five-factor model holds for that model. Then we move on to psychological well-being. Finally, we combined psychological well-being and subjective well-being and in the one model, in the one joint five-factor model. We first tested a three, this is a basic model. Before you move on to the five-factor model, you always start with the multiple-factor model. The three-factor model reveals, these are the correlations. I can, you can see, I think they're very high ranges from 0.6 to 0.76. And this, mapped, uh, this model actually fit the data very well. Um, this, you can see the, this is the subjective well-being. This is a general factor, captures subjective well-being across all domains. And these are unique, specific domain factors. Let's look at uh, this, the general factor, and then that's, these are the fixed statistics. I did not, I tested other models. I did not put the statistics here, but the bifactor model also gives you the best fit. That means it gives you the best approximation, the most accurate approximation to your data set. So you can see across study one and study two, the fit in terms of this, fit statistics are very, very similar. One is an undergraduate sample, one is a national representative sample. That means the model is very robust. The model is robust across two different samples. In general, items have stronger loadings on the general factor than on the domain specific factors. That means the general factor is more dominant than the domain specific factors. However, negative affect loaded equally strong on the general factor and the domain-specific factor of negative impact. That means its variance is equally split between the two factors. What's RMSEA? What are the, the, the columns here? Oh, I see. RMSEA, this is confidence. I have two slides, uh, some slides specifically explain the fixed statistics. Yeah, because Okay, can we hold on to that question and I will come back. Yeah, thank you. That's a very good question. I debated whether I should put the slides here or not. Thank you. And then we tested a six factor confirmatory factor analysis model for psychological well-being. Well, these correlations are even are very troublesome. Look at the purpose in life and personal growth. It's 0.9. Essentially, it tells you they're one domain. So that's one major issue facing pararips psychological well-being scale. Conceptually, they're supposed to measure six related yet distinct domains, but empirically, we found over and over again they don't they don't differentiate each other. So we really need better measures for well-being. There's a lot of work needs to be done. Environmental mastery and self-acceptance, 0.94, and the other correlation also very high. 
So if you use these six domains in the regression equation, the model will collapse. Mm -hmm. Basically, it'll collapse because they're just too high. The correlation really gave us problems. So here is the five-factor model for the psychological well-being. So we collapsed. Given these high correlations, we collapsed mastery and self-acceptance, growth and purpose, collapsed into one subdomain, and that's the general factor that captures the psychological well-being, the overall. And then we are left with four specific domains. And also, we don't want to have any, too many domain factors because we want a parsimonious model. If you have six or eight, you're going to be in big trouble. Six, eight factors, yeah. So try to develop a measurement model that's parsimonious, as parsimonious as possible. Then you'll have, your life will be much easier. Can you do an exploratory factor analysis to see whether or not all these factors split up into the right four domains? That's a very, very good question. Um, I'm glad we have some experts here. <laughs> yeah, I did. I tried um, different types of. Um, oh, we have one factor model, a six factor model, and also second order model based on the literature. So all we tried different types of models, and this best fit to the data. Yeah, we can talk more about it because people have done a model factor analysis for cycles as well. Yeah, and exploratory. Uh, what's good about it? Um, confirmed your factor analysis is it gives you fixed statistics to tell whether the model fits the data well or not. But also there's a recent new development. It's called the exploratory confirmed your factor analysis. It combines both. Hmm. And I have some, I have used both um, that approach with this too. And this factor model still holds it. Yes. So that's, thank you. That's again, that's a very good question. So the recent development it can allow you by Herbert Marsh. He was in Austria now. He got recruited to Oxford. Yeah, yeah I know. Yes. Uh -huh. He's good at both. He's good at his substantive area, self-concept. He's a school psychologist. He's also very good at methodologically. So. Thank you. And the exploratory confirmatory. So in confirmatory, you're setting the different models and preparing the fit. But in exploratory confirmatory, are you leaving it up to the software to sort of create more models? What's the so difference? So you, uh, the difference is in the exploratory confirmatory factor analysis. You can, you still, you set up these. So you set up the, for example, we have a four factor model here. So we use specify which items mainly will load on the four factors. And then you also allow secondary factor loading. So these items, they will not, for example, these four, they will not only load on autonomy, they will also, they have the freedom to move to these domains as well. If they don't load on them, you see zero or 0 0.01, 0 0.05, non-significant, very trivial. So if they're cross loadings, you will see them right away. Yeah, it is a very useful approach, but also there are some issues and it's in my next, on my to-do list to, ex to test this, um, New approach. Yeah. Good questions. Yeah. So that these are the fit statistics for the psychological well-being. You can see the fit general fit the data adequately, and uh, the items load stronger loadings on the general factor. That's expected because look at the correlations. They're very very high. And autonomy loaded equally strong on the domain and general factors. And just like negative effect, the balance is equally split between the two factors. So then we did a combined, a joint five-factor model analysis because the general factor, so hypothetically, the general factor, well-being factor would allow us to capture the commonality shared by the two types of well-being. And then the domain-specific factors would allow us to capture the domain-specific well-being to subjective well-being and to psychological well-being. You put in all, oh yeah, all the Go ahead. So you put in all the subdomains, not just autonomy, like not just the one that was found to be the same as the general factor. Yes, you put all in of all them the together. Factors. Yes, um, this one 
Well, see, see them here, you see. This is a general factor across global well-being, across subjective well-being and psychological well-being. These are the four domains we found based on the psychological well-being factor and model because we class these two because of the very, very high correlation and these three domain factors for subjective well-being. That's the subjective well-being that captures the domain-specific psychological well-being. And then these are the fixed statistics. They fit the data, the model fit the data generally well, reasonably well. And then we relate it. Then that's the part, the predictive power of general well-being we tested and psychological well-being and subjective well-being, the domain-specific well-being, well-being. So we have, this is an example of the outcome variables because we have a wide range of outcome variables. So that's the general well-being factor. And these are the outcome variables. You can see self-esteem, optimism, relationship quality, social support, self-enhancement, you think you're better than others, and depression. So depression, general factor, is you can see the magnitude actually is very strong. Um, general factor is strongly related to these outcome variables. Depression is negative, makes sense. And then on top, over and above the predictive power of general well being, we also see predictive power of these domain specific factors. Domain specific factors. So, and actually, for overlapping measures, we see these results are replicated across the small sample and the nationally representative sample. So these, these results actually tell us the general factor has a strong predictive power and domain-specific factors. They also have unique predictive power. They also demonstrate unique predictive power. So let's look at the relations of well-being to biomarkers. So these relations relatively they are weak because um, well-being was collected in 2006. The biomarkers were collected in 2009. There's three years gap, three year gap. And with a large sample, if you have a, even with a small effect size, it's very, very meaningful. It's a large sample. So general well-being is related to body mass, negatively related to a body mass index, your good cholesterol, very good, your um, total the ratio, total versus the good cholesterol ratio. And also it's related to the DHEAS. We did log transformation and square transformation as well, and whenever necessary. Independent of the predictive power of general well-being, Purpose and growth also is related to waste ratio. So if your life has a sense of purpose, actually it's really good. You look better. You actually look better if, you're, if you believe your life, you're growing, your life, your life has purpose. And it's positive related to your good cholesterol. And it's negative related to plasma IL-6 and related to this indicator as well. Positive effect is Negatively related to body mass index and also your cortisone change. The cortisone change represents the measure two levels, baseline level, and then they give them a challenge test. And, and then they measure it again, whether see your cortisone will increase. So that's that's where um, that's where it is. So negative effect is related to cortisone change as well. And life satisfaction is on the next page. You can see life satisfaction is related to your glucose, glucose level. General well-being is positively related to sleep duration. That means your duration is longer. If you are you have a you have better general well-being, you sleep longer duration, uninterrupted sleep. <laughs> so you have better sleep quality, actually. And then these are self-evaluation. General well-being is related to your Physical health, your self evaluation, your mental health as well. Positive effect is related to physical health, and negative effect is related to mental health. So, the general factor 
has stronger predictive power in general, but the domain-specific factors also demonstrated unique predictive power independent of the general factor. That means both general and domain-specific factors are important in our research. The conclusion is the general factor of well-being um, represents the core, the, the, um, the overlap between the two types of well-being. So the two types of well-being are strongly related to each other at the general construct level. Therefore, they are similar. They are similar at the general, at the higher level. However, the fact that these domain-specific factors they also demonstrated unique predictive power. That means the two types of well-being are distinct. So they are similar and distinct. Which I'm so very confused. Everybody so got everybody chocolate. Right. <laughs> we all yeah. got chocolate. Yes, we all got chocolate today. Yes. Yes. Overall well-being versus the Yeah. So the take-home message is the bifactor model provides a reasonable support for both views. So they were right, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, it's that they are related and yet distinct, depending on the level of analysis. If you look at the higher level, the function, they are very similar. They are very, however, if you look at the lower level, the subdomains, they do function differently, depending on the outcome variable. They have their unique predictive power. Therefore, the bifactor model actually serves a very useful tool for reconciliating these two camps of researchers, different views. And a more comprehensive model of well being should encompass both subjective well being and psychological well being. So, in terms of well being research, in the past, in psychology, as God knows this, traditionally we said depression, anxiety, very depressing, right? But now, a researcher from and his team from UPenn is has been promoting the positive psychology. So there are new research and new measurements, new skills about flourishing. That's the exciting part. That's where my research is going, um, going to. It's studying the positive psychology, what positive well-being can do to flourishing, to to do to our body and to our health, our relationship, etc. So there are new research emerging from this line of research, um, this line of work, and it's just it's very exciting time to study well-being. Finally, I would like to thank all my collaborators. Um, I have a collaborator from China, and Xiaomi was my graduate student at UT. That's my graduate student. He's an assistant professor at Chinese Academy of Sciences. And Adele is from my colleague from UD, JP, and Carol. He was our title professor at UD. He's retired. And Carver is from Miami. Karen is from uh, Colorado. And Steve was my graduate mentor. And also um, Zui from right here in house. <laughs> yeah. Um, in addition, um, this is the two, I want to introduce other, just a couple of other references too. This is from a 2012 paper with my colleagues. It's, but it has also been widely cited. And this is the paper. Some of the presentation is based on this 2013 paper. And again, this paper has gained, um, been widely cited too. And we have, to agree on that, we have a new chapter just came out on Bifac Money. In fact, in this February. Yeah. Yay! Yay! Thank you. Thank you <laughs> and Dina asked me to take this slide. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I would like to thank Dina. She has been so gracious, oh. so helpful. Who is the head here? Get Dina Reed. <laughs> <laughs> she has done a great job in terms of the whole pro and, you know, communication process. Thank you so much, Dina. It's a pleasure. On the model, yes. one um, maybe limitation might be that it's entirely based and for cross-sectional time, right? So are you thinking about either longitudinally collecting it or using other sources of data? Of course. Yeah. That's why I included it. You know, self-reported data, it's a major limitation. Yeah. 
and the this public data set. That's why I use the um, the biomarkers. Mm -hmm. That's not self-report. Right. And also, there's a, there's a gap between it's 2006 to 2009. Right, right. They have two waves. Okay. So first, that's a major limitation of self-report data can be limited. So I am. I do. If we can talk about more, definitely collect longitudinal data, non-self-report data, and other types of data as well. It's very, very important. We collect data from different sources, and then if the evidence converges, that's very exciting. But on the other hand, I would like to defend self-report data because in research we have a lot, a lot of such data. Actually, they are valid. They are very, very useful as well. Yeah. So. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, they are self-reported data. We have people have been tested over and over again, and they are actually they were no they were about the response set, etc. But actually, those kind of effects are small compared to the true effects. Yes, but that's a really good question. I'd love to talk more about it. Other types of other ways to collect data other than uh, self-report. Because a certain amount of the variance that's shared is also the method variance. Yes, it's, it's due to. Right. Even researchers have tested this uh, because this is a classic issue. Right. Even you partial out the common variance, the major effects still stand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what gives us confidence of using self-reported data. But that doesn't mean other types of data are not important, absolutely. It's a convergent, different methods. It's multi method, multi -method. Multi -method. Yeah. yes, exactly, multi method and multi source data. It's very, very important. Yes. But when, when you are studying well being, I mean, how, what other type of data than self report can you, because it's extremely subjective, right? I mean, that's well, what. I mean, it's so what like to use depression, something, so the BDI is one of the measures of depression you had up there. So that's validated against, for instance, a clinician's. Diagnosis, right? Do people with higher BDI scores are they more likely to be diagnosed with chronic depression? So that's one way to do it. Another way I was just thinking about is more of these devices. You could start to get um, intensive data collection, over, so yes. that's still self report, but then you can also get sort of ecological momentary. Are you doing something that, you know, what are your sort of behaviors you're engaging in? Is that sort of a proxy for positive affect, negative affect, you know? Exactly. Momentary data within this device, you know, some. Uh, the research I will talk about the well-being researchers from Penn. They are that they have collected a lot of kind, of, a lot of this kind of data. It is momentary data, affect, fluctuation, daily affect, fluctuation, etc. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's very. It's uh, expensive to conduct this kind of research, but it's very, very valuable. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Well, that's, I'm interested yeah. in what you said about Christiana uh -huh. sort of measuring well-being, and I mean we are doing intensive. JP and I are doing that in the cancer center. Oh, wonderful. And we do it over time. And then we we do bring in other non-self-report measures. And I think just I bring up the self-report issue for two things. Certainly funding and they're more they're excited when you show validation with other methods. But then just translating the stuff that we're talking about here to non-psych-minded clinic other types of clinical staff and leadership sometimes it's harder for them to kind of follow those nuances but if you connect it to um which you know adherence or um uh, likelihood of going to an appointment or those kinds of things i think all of a sudden it, it clicks and so those things i mean yeah i'd be interested in talking more about oh that's that's a very uh, that's an excellent idea actually doing this screening risk factors psychosocial risk factors and resilience factors, et cetera. I right. think it's very, very important for them if you can understand, yes, translation research to common sense and how it can be related to what we are doing here at Christiana yeah. Care. Yes, yeah, the translation, it's very important. Thank you. But I think the other important component that we come up a lot when we think about if there's a way, the importance of you know, identifying this in the population, like especially in the Christian care population, but then the pragmatic components of that, of, of the time and labor it, that's needed to get self-reported information. Oh, this would such have to be funded. Yeah. yeah. 
But here's the true story. Like, I it. meant kind of like something where longer term, like embedding something into standard practice in terms of assessing well-being. Yes. Well, I think, I think that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, so just that this yeah. is actually based on a story that came out of a conversation with Chuck Carver at a bar on Main Street. I won't give you too many details. <laughs> <laughs> but he was on my committee, and you may know him. He's sort of an intimidating guy, and people ask me why would I ever invite him to be on my committee. So I you guess. You were brave. <laughs> Post-graduation, I'm employed. I finally mustered the courage to ask him something that I had been too afraid to ask him before. And I guess I had a little liquid courage. And um, I said, you know, Chuck, you talk a lot about optimism and neuroticism, right? These are yes. the things that he focuses on. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't understand why it's all that noteworthy. That if I ask you if you're more likely to see things in a positive light, that later it happens to be correlated with you're in a better mood. I mean, duh, right? And so he said, no, that's, that's fair, but what's, what's most helpful about optimism is that in a couple of questions, I can make a pretty good prediction of how you're going to deal with things for the next several years or even your lifetime. So as a result of that, I said, so this is right around the time that we were being mandated to screen for distress and cancer patients. And there's all these questions, right? To your point exactly, pragmatically, how do you do this? In standard practice, and when do you do? Do you do it when someone's diagnosed? Everyone's distressed when they're diagnosed. Right. Do you wait to a future appointment? Well, it depends what kind of news, they have, right? So there's a lot of false positives and all that stuff. So we just instead said, why don't we ask people at the very beginning, you know, a couple of these more enduring trait things, like optimism, and then the people who who are who are scoring lower on those things, those are the people we want to focus on over time. So actually using the same kind of thinking you're talking about, when do we want to use a general factor? When do we want to use a specific factor? What predicts what? We're actually able to pare down what some centers do, 20, 30 questions, to like five questions and seamlessly integrate it into workflow. So I think the funded work is necessary to, to get all that data and answer those four questions. But then you can have very practical applications of that into practice. And that's the part that I'm intrigued by here. I think based on things you've already learned, you can start to think about how would Christiana understand well-being or the We're obviously not going to administer 16 measures, right? right? But maybe we don't need to. Yes. Maybe five questions is a really good start. Well, we do do that in the practice. When a patient comes into Christiana Care to see a doctor, they're asked three questions. How do they feel? Are they depressed? Are they suicidal? Yeah, no, and then we. I know, but that's just about depression, and then now people want to ask about anxiety and suicide, right. and it becomes it very quickly to turn into a lot. And I think we can be thoughtful about you know this work lets us have some insight about how, where's the where would we want to start. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Can I ask one more question? Of course. Is, I I think this is a distinction, but you can tell me if I'm correct. Um, is there any work? being done that looks at how subjective well-being affects psychological well-being like if someone so again like you're i think you're kind of saying how you know they are they assessing the same thing are they kind of you know describing the patient people similarly but is anyone looking at the relationship between directional relationships yeah um I think there is some research. I don't remember the detail on top of my head. Yeah, people have looked at whether even within the domains of subjective well-being, mm -hmm. researchers have argued that positive affect and negative affect, affect combined the affect life satisfaction. So there's a predictive relationship right there, but the research doesn't support that in terms of the directional relationship. They're so intertwined. Right. Yeah. But it is a good question. It's an interesting question. And that would take some thinking to develop longitudinal studies, etc., to tease apart the directional relationships and also Leah mentioned the interaction effects, etc. So it is a complex issue, but I just think it's very exciting we can get into it. Um, and it's an exciting topic. And uh, Christiana actually provides a great platform for doing this kind of research. Yeah. I'm going to ask a question that shows my ignorance. Is the five-factor model a special application of a structural inclusion model? Yes. Yes. That's what it is. It's just. Yes. yes. I teach yes, um, uh, SCM at ET on a regular basis once a year. Yeah. Okay. It is a special case. Yes. It's a special case of that. It is. It is. Yes. Good question. Yeah.
use the same software to do the same analysis. Well, the structural equation modeling I can use as a case. I mean, I can use anus. Yeah, it's actually it's data. I don't need M plus. No, you don't. Do the bifactor. Even R factor. Yes, yeah, even R. But the bifactor yeah. model, you use M plus. You can use yeah. You can use uh, like theta or R or A plus. You could. Yeah, yeah, easily. It can be in, uh, implemented. But if we wanted to buy M plus, it's really fun. <laughs> it's really expensive. Too. <laughs> I don't use it too. I don't use it our budget. But I have very easy to should buy a copy. We. Oh, you we have, have one. Okay. You have it. You have it. Oh, I have <laughs> one. Yeah. You have one. 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 You have one.